The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Well-known passages, probably the best-known passage in all of the New Testament appears in this text. Listen now from the third chapter of John. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. And he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to Jesus, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things. No one has ascended into the heaven except the one who descended from the heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. So whoever believes in him, might not perish, but have everlasting life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the living word of God will stand forever. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. A long time ago, a half a century ago, even I went to the 10th grade. And I remember 10th grade geometry. And perhaps you remember geometry too, those proofs that you had. And I liked doing the proofs, even though now I could not do them. They have been long forgotten. I liked knowing the truth of the proof. Math always interested me me, especially at the lower level. It escapes me at calculus. Two plus two equals four. 
It doesn't matter whether you are in the United States, in Siberia, on the South Pole, 2 plus 2 equals 4, and that's the truth. Now, I liked physics, the Newtonian laws of truth. I get lost in quantum physics, but the Newtonian laws, the greater the mass, the greater the gravitational pull. That is the truth you can rely on. I like truth. What I know to be true, usually I get a sense of satisfaction and a sense of security that I am right. And I like being right. Because it gives me a sense of being in control. And I was raised at a time and in an educational environment where we were taught that there was one interpretation to, let's say, a poem. Or let's say, a biblical text. When you searched long and hard enough and thought about it enough, you would come up with the original intent of the author. And that was the truth. And that was particularly true when I read the Bible and went to Bible school and Sunday school. There's one meaning to the text. And enough study, it will become self-evident to you. And any other interpretation was just wrong. Made me feel pretty good. And then... I was exposed to Greek and Hebrew. And I soon realized that many interpretations that I held as infallible truth, those texts were not accurately translated from the Hebrew and Greek. Poor translation. And then I found out that there are many varying manuscripts, especially in the New Testament. Different readings. Oh, no. What do I do? And then I read the Biblica Hebraica, which is the Hebrew Bible. There are words in the Hebrew Bible that cannot be translated into English. They can't even be translated into modern Hebrew. We've lost their meaning. This unsettled me. How can then I preach when I don't know absolutely the truth. As the years have meandered on, I have come to believe that those who stand in the pulpit are more like fingers. Fingers pointing at a harvest full moon rising in all of its beauty and glory, or pointing at the great constellations in the heavens at night. And I've also realized that, that my need for certainty about the one meaning of the text was more about me than it was about God. I wanted security. I wanted to be right. For example, Thomas Aquinas, 13th century theologian, laid out in logical fashion five proofs for the existence of God. I believed him. 
I believed him until I read David Hume, a Scots philosopher. I read also Immanuel Kant and Friedrich Schleiermacher. And I came to the conclusion after reading those people that what Aquinas had done is not proved the existence of God, but proved the possibility of the existence of God. You see where this is going? Wanting absolute rational proof is about our being correct. Nicodemus was a well-educated man, and he, like us, wanted some proof. He's a kind of seeing is believing kind of guy. Show me, and I will believe. Show me that you are the one sent from God. Show me that you are the Messiah. Show me that you are Israel's hope. Show me the kingdom of heaven. And I will believe. Like us, Nicodemus wants proof. Because we are seeing is believing kind of people. But there is a part of life that is so much like the wind. Who of us has seen the wind? We say we see the wind, but we do not see it. We see the results of the wind. Even in a great sandstorm, you do not see the wind. You see the particles of sand carried on by the wind. Biblical language likes the idea of wind in the Old and New Testament. The biblical word for wind is ruach, or breath of God. God breathed the ruach into the nostrils of the first human being, and they come to life. In the New Testament, the word is pneuma, the spirit being breath. The breath of God breathed out upon them, and they received the Holy Spirit, Acts says. We can't see it. How many in here don't believe there is such thing as a wind? I didn't think so. We felt it. If someone were to say to me, I don't believe in the wind, and I'd take them down to the next hurricane and stand them on the shore. There's a fool on television that always likes to stand up there as it's blowing 120 miles an hour. I'm waiting for him to blow away. He once got in a wind tunnel at 140 and his face almost flew off his, his cheeks. M makes for marvelous viewing. We can't see it, but we believe it because of the results of the wind. Jesus tells Nicodemus, you want to see the kingdom of heaven? You must be born from above. Now, I've got to tell you, for most of us, for Presbyterians, the word born again has fallen into disfavor. We start scooching back on our seats or kindly, kindly turning a deaf ear. And the Greek says it's born from above. And Jesus says only that which has been born by the Spirit is spirit. Flesh can't make this spirit come. And only those who have been born from above can see what I'm talking about. Those 
who believe, then they can see. There's a difference. I remember so many years ago, and some of you will remember, and some of you will not have the memory. Back in the, during the Cold War, the arms race was going on. The Soviets were beating us into space. And the first cosmonaut that went up came back and they interviewed him and said, you went into the heavens, did you see God? And he said, yet, no, nowhere was God. Then I think it's John Glenn who goes up into space. And when he comes back and he said, did you see God? They asked him. And there was nowhere that God was not, was Glenn's answer. Everywhere. Sometimes we only see what we expect to see. Now, I am always interested in hearing what opponents to religion have to say. In the last decade and a half, the atheists have produced their great prophet, Dr. Richard Dawkins, an Oxford professor who interprets science and culture. He is the author of The God Delusion. Oh, people quote Dawkins everywhere, not in the Christian church, for sure. He believes in all things that have come to be are random. There's no sense to any of it. He's hostily, in this book, The God Delusion, critiques Thomas Aquinas' five proofs for the existence of God. Now, he has fallen into quite disfavor with academics. According to some in the field of philosophy, especially in medieval philosophy and religion at Oxford University, and I will quote to you what they have said. It is quite clear that Dr. Dawkins didn't understand Aquinas. It would have been nice if he would have checked with us, those of us who study medieval philosophy and religious thought, to validate his understanding of Aquinas. But he doesn't have a clue. End quote. Dawkins set out looking for nothing, and he found what he was looking for. Nothing. Now, do you believe in love? I got to tell you this, the first service, this was funny, I couldn't pass it up. A young man brought his girlfriend, sitting right behind where Charles is, sitting there with Blair. Sits. And when I asked that, she looked at him with these big brown eyes and smiled. And he looked at her. Her father sitting on the pew, and I said, I saw that. Dad's getting worried. Do you believe in love? How do you know that's not just biochemistry? Just some innate gene to lead to reproduction so we can all enjoy the chaos.
You know, there are some axioms that you cannot prove. I want to prove that love exists, but I can't get my hands around any rational proof. And neither can you. But as a species, we crave it. We crave to be loved. As a matter of fact, if you take an infant born and all you do is stick the bottle in that child's mouth and never pick that child up and cuddle the child, never touch the child, talk to the child, do you know that child will die? It's called a failure to thrive. There are certain truths in this life that cannot be proven with certainty, with a rational mind. And there are certain truths that can be. But the truths of which we talk today and what Jesus is talking about, the spiritual truths of life are like the wind. We feel the effects of them, and they are real. But it all depends on what you're looking for. Yes, this world has two kinds of truths. Those we see and then believe, and those we believe and then see. Regarding the things of God, the kingdom of heaven, we believe first. We say, yes, you are the Lord. And then we begin to see. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that Whosoever should believe in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. He came into the world not to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Do you believe that? It's one of those heavenly things. It must be believed to see it. And it cannot be proven otherwise. Those born from above by the power of the Spirit are given the ability to believe. Not overriding us, but we are given the ability to make that choice. And once we believe, We can see God's movement all around us. Believing is seeing. What do you see today? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.